let's move on to today's topics. So today we are covering three topics, or perhaps I should say as much as possible of these three topics, because I believe that uh, we actually have a rather a tight schedule for today. So the last chapter for today, uh, which is indexing, I will probably uh, not cover in full detail today. I may shift some of it to tomorrow. So today's agenda is to start off with how to build web-based applications. Now, application design is not really the same as database design. It's a different issue. However, what we realize is that most applications are database-backed, and typically there are no other courses which cover application design in most universities. So we took it upon ourselves to cover application design along with database design. And that really helps our database projects too, because what use is a database project which doesn't have a front end? If it's just a bunch of uh, relations and SQL queries, it's useless. Nothing can be done with it. So any realistic project has to have a user interface and it has to have some uh, notion of what it is implementing. So from the viewpoint of our course projects also, um, application development is very, very important. So in IIT Bombay, we tend to cover the uh, details of this particular chapter on uh, application design and development as part of the lab associated with the course rather than with the course itself. These are mostly very practical issues. There's no deep theory here, but there are important practical uh, lessons which students have to learn. So uh, depending on uh, how you do it in your university, it could be part of the theory course or an associated lab component. Now, this chapter in our book is actually fairly extensive. Okay, to continue, um, we uh, are going to look at web application design primarily because today pretty much all interfaces are web interfaces. This was obviously not true about 15 years back because that's when the web made its appearance. The web started appearing around uh, 1993 was, I think, when it was introduced. It uh, soon uh, became well known by around 94, 95. It uh, started growing within the US and Europe was where it started, of course. And it spread to India maybe just after that, 95, 96. People in India started becoming aware. So in that era, well into uh, you know 2000s, pretty much all database applications were not yet web-based. They were standalone applications which people had to load on their PCs and then run. And this had a lot of problems. Uh, one of the problems was that whenever you change the application, you had to actually copy it onto thousands of PCs across the world. What if you did not copy it? You would have one copy of that application using the old uh, code and another copy using the new code and they could clash and uh, there could be lots of problems due to this. So having separate standalone applications which are distributed across a geographic region can be very troublesome. Even if it's not distributed, for example, most of the banks in India, before the advent of core banking, they had uh, their databases sitting in each branch. So each branch had a number of terminals which would access the local database directly and perform updates on it. So what was the problem with this? The problem was that every bank had to have a person who was in charge of keeping the database secure, who was in charge of uh, backing up the database. Um, if uh, any problem happened, fire flooding, the bank couldn't afford to lose data. So every day backups had to be done. If there was any hardware problem with the server, they had to deal with that. Uh, so there were a lot of issues. And then each branch would have its own copy of the code. And sometimes updates would happen on one branch and not in another. So the bank would be dealing inconsistently across branches. They would be doing different things in different branches. So uh, this became a nightmare. And uh, for this reason, in addition, of course, to the convenience to customers that you can go to any branch anywhere and do your transactions, uh, that is the reason why banks moved to core banking. And in fact, if you have ever gone uh, and looked at what people are doing behind the terminal in banks which have core banking, um, wherever I have looked, they're actually using a web browser. 
And so, what has happened is all our banking functionality now runs on the web. And this is something very core. Of course, they do not run on the public web. They have their own intranet. Public web is asking for trouble because people can easily hack in. But what has happened is that they have an application sitting in the central servers. There are probably multiple machines in there handling the requests, a single database and everything is, uh, the interface is completely web browser based. The same thing has repeated in many places. Wherever applications interact with end users as opposed to internal customers, internal staff, it has to be web based because there is no question of you are installing an application, well more or less, there are exceptions, but it is almost always web based. So, web interfaces are core today. They are not universal. Even today, uh, I am sure that many of your colleges use applications which are not web based. And part of the reason is, uh, it is actually easier to develop uh, client based applications. The tools for those are, even today they are a little easier to use than web based tools. It is changing, but it is not changed 100 percent. So, many companies are selling um, college and university automation systems, which are not web based. In my opinion, that is a very backward step. It is asking for uh, trouble, because upgrading, maintaining, everything is harder. In fact, uh, there is another uh, well known issue of security. So, um, NIC reported at one point, that they had built an application for somebody. This was a while back, before they really went into web based applications. And the problem was with uh, client server based applications, is that code runs on the client's machine. And the server in these things is a dumb database, which no program is running on the database. The programs are all running on the client side. So, the database simply offers maybe an SQL engine, that is it. So, now the problem is that the code on, which is running on the user's machine, the user can modify that code. It is not very hard to do so. So, uh, somebody uh, actually did a demo for them, where in the space of 5 minutes, they were able to get direct access to the backend database and modify it as they pleased. Even though the code was written carefully, such that it did all kinds of validations and prevented updates, the problem was that code had direct access to the database. It was sending SQL queries directly to the database through the connection. The password for that connection was on the client machine. So, these hackers could easily get at that password, directly connect to the database and directly do the updates in there, defeating security entirely. So, this is the other major Achilles heel of running code on the client machine. The client machine should just be a front end which offers screens. All logic including authentication, authorization, whatever, what not should never ever run on the client side. That is the model. Now, that does not mean no code should run on the client side. There is often a need for code, which does presentation. It builds the graphical interface. It allows you to drag and drop and do fancy stuff. That can decide on the client. Okay. So, that is a fundamental issue in application design. So, um, these slides cover some of these issues. So, first of all, as I said, an application has to be split into several parts. There is a front end, a middle layer and a back end. The back end is usually an SQL database. The front end is stuff that runs on your browser and the middle layer is really the application program. The core of the logic is in here. So, the front end has uh, web based interfaces. Initially, the web based interfaces were all static HTML. So, you have a HTML page, you fill a form, submit, goes back to the server, does something, gives you a result. Now, you go to another form, fill, submit. So, every interaction went to the server and came back. Now, soon people realized that it is, it would be better to catch certain errors at the beginning rather than send it to the server and then catch it. What if somebody entered a roll number wrong? Uh, why even send it to the server? You should not. Can you catch it locally? And thus arose JavaScript, a uh, scripting language, which was initially designed to do simple tasks at the front end. Over a period of time, uh, JavaScript was actually very nicely designed. It, it had a cool uh, interface to, al which allowed it to modify the web page, which was being displayed. And people made very creative use of it. 
to build applications that had very rich functionality. For example, if you use uh, Gmail or Yahoo Mail today, you can do all kinds of stuff which happen locally without actually going to the back end. And that is a lot faster for you because you do not have to wait for a round trip, submit goes somewhere, takes a while to come back over the network and then your screen is refreshed, that is slow. So, the front end over here, the graphical user interface has become quite rich over the years without doing any software installation. All of the software which is running is actually being shipped uh, to your browser by the website on the fly. Okay, so, that is a quick overview of what we want to do. Now, here is a diagrammatic representation of the evolution of applications over three eras. The first era was before the PCs. In that era, the only computers, real computers were big mainframe machines, which sat in a, a data center and cost millions of dollars, crores of rupees. And the users were, you know, nobody had uh, machines in their home. Uh, uh, computers were very expensive, in even PCs. So, the only thing which could uh, people could afford to put at uh, the clerical staff's desk were called terminals. They were called dumb terminals initially, because all they could do was enter characters and display characters sent back from the computer. But soon people realized that dumb terminals take up too much uh, load on the mainframe. So, very soon IBM had actually introduced what they called intelligent terminals. It turns out these intelligent terminals could accept a form and with fields to be filled in. It allowed the teller or the clerical staff or whoever to fill in the fields in that form. And then there was actually a button called submit on the keyboard. It was not on the screen. Today, you are used to clicking submit on the screen. In that area, there was a submit button on the keyboard. So, they pressed the submit button and only at that point did anything go back to the mainframe. And then the mainframe processed the request and sent something back, which again would be displayed on the screen. And guess what? The screen display could be formatted. You could have fields here and there, uh, which displayed information in a way, which made it easy for users. So, when the web first came up, um, there is a person called uh, C. Mohan, uh, who is in IBM. He is very well known for his recovery algorithms. We will see a bit uh, of that when we cover recovery. Um, so, he was going around telling people that when the web came up, he said, hey, uh, the web browser is nothing new. IBM had it from the 1960s, because it already had a terminal with forms and submit button, uh, which was actually true. It seemed very odd at that time, but if you think about it, it was really the same idea, but with one big difference. The terminal could not connect to any old application it wanted across the world. It could only connect to that one application on that one mainframe. That is it. It could not talk to anybody else. The reason the web explosively grew was you could talk to anybody in the world. So, that was a huge difference. Okay, so, that was the mainframe era, where you had a network which was typically running on top of phone lines and terminals. If you bought an airline ticket at the Indian Airlines office, they had a terminal connected over the phone network to their central computer wherever it was, Bombay or wherever it was. The next era, so PC is becoming very cheap. So, um, everybody who was, uh, let us say, in industry or in, uh, you know, faculty in universities, all got their own PC on their desktop. So, then a lot of people said, these mainframes are very, very expensive. Do not buy mainframes. Run a, a database server on a PC and then run your applications on PCs and so the desktop PCs containing an application program, which ran over a local area network and connected to a database running SQL. This was the personal computer era. This was roughly the 1980s, early 80s through early 90s, when most applications were built like this. Uh, and in fact, people would go around and saying uh, D blue. What was this D blue? Well, IBM was known as Big Blue. Uh, its uh, trademark color was blue, so it was uh, widely known as Big Blue. So, uh, what people went around saying is, de-blue yourself. Go away from blue and 
uh, run things much, much cheaper by installing fairly cheap uh, PCs in, in your office. Do not buy a mainframe anymore. And that actually convinced a lot of people it worked. It reduced costs. But like I told you, there were a lot of security issues which were okay as long as you had airline staff sitting in an airline office running that application. But there is no question of allowing you know, anybody in a university or in the world to access that application. And when the web came up, it solved all the problems of the personal computer era. Okay. So, as I said, uh, web browsers are the de facto user interface and they are very convenient because you do not need to do any installation. If uh, tomorrow Gmail wants to add a feature, it is very, very easy for them. They do not have to tell everyone, okay, now you have to install the new version of Gmail. No. Instead, they just update the application on the server and when the user logs in next time, they will receive a slightly different JavaScript which will make the screen look slightly different, but they do not have to install anything. It just works seamlessly. Okay. So, now, here is a quick uh, question to get uh, people uh, awake. Uh, center coordinators, please make sure your receivers are connected and the software is running. Uh, we, are, uh, we will activate the question in a bit, but let me read the question. The question is, Webmail systems such as Gmail and Yahoo use static HTML only, run JavaScript on the browser, run Flash on the browser or run C code on the browser. Those are your four options. Do not answer the question yet until we tell you to go ahead. Okay. Time is up. So, I had given this answer to the question uh, right on this slide and the previous slide. The answer is they use JavaScript. What is, uh, the, in an earlier era, maybe uh, 10 years ago, um, Yahoo Mail and I think even the early versions of Gmail used primarily static HTML. Even now, there are many uh, mail applications which universities use. Uh, we use something called Squirrel Mail, a web based interface to our internal mail, which is basically static HTML. It is an old system. But with that, you cannot get rich functionality. You cannot drag and drop. You cannot have mail, uh, you know, refreshing itself automatically without disturbing the screen uh, and a number of other functionalities which are, which you have come to expect out of these systems. The only way to provide it is to run some scripts, to run a program actually on the browser. And that program is typically in the JavaScript language, which all browsers support. There is uh, this system called Flash, which is used widely for videos. And in fact, AView, I believe, uses Flash. So, what you are seeing today is actually running Flash on the browser uh, or maybe as a standalone application. Uh, the thing with Flash is uh, it is designed for uh, video and audio. It is not that useful for basic uh, graph GUI functionality, although it can be used for that. And the last option is C code on the browser. That would be a very, very bad idea because uh, when I say C code, it would be compiled C code. If you download um, machine code directly and run it, the problem is that it can do anything it wants to your machine. So, if somebody emails you an .exe file on, uh, and on your Windows machine, you say open it and run it, guess what it is most probably going to do? It is most probably a virus which has replicated itself and it is going to take over your machine and there is no control. So, this is a very, very dangerous thing to do. But then JavaScript is also a program. So, why is it okay to run JavaScript programs, but not to run a dot exe? And the difference is that JavaScript uh, language is controlled and it the program which you get can be verified. You, the interpreter will prevent it from doing any actions to the local files. It will not let you arbitrarily save data into some local file, overwriting it and so on. So, it is protected. The language interpreter will make sure that the program does not do any damage to your computer. So, it is safe to run JavaScript. Actually, even then, running JavaScript from an arbitrary website, which is designed to exploit errors in a JavaScript interpreters can be dangerous. But any genuine website will not have such 
evil JavaScript programs, and so it is safe to run JavaScript. Now, coming back to the answers, the answer is obviously Flash. Okay, so now I took a while to motivate the web. Maybe this is stuff you knew already. Uh, I'm sure you know about HTML and hyperlinks. Uh, I'm going to skip uh, some of these slides in the interest of time, uh, but introduce you to this terminology, which some of you probably know, most of you know, but in case you don't. HTML is the uh, formatting which you see if you look at the source of a web page. It's the hypertext markup language. HTTP, on the other hand, is the hypertext transfer protocol. And this protocol actually does more than simply send a HTML page back to you. This protocol allows a two-way communication between your browser and the application. The browser can send a request. The application can send HTML text back. But it can also tell the browser, here is a piece of text. Save it. It's called a cookie. And it can also tell the browser, I think I sent you a cookie earlier. If you have it, please send that value back to me. And that value is used to identify who is the uh, user, as, as we will see in a bit. So there, there are many more things which are, form, which are part of the protocol, but it's a two-way communication. The browser can ask something. In response, the application can ask for something more. The browser sends it. The application asks for something else. The browser sends it then the application sends the final web page back. And after this, the browser can again ask the application for something else. So it can keep going on. HTML itself is a markup language, which, as you know, provides uh, uh, formatting, bold, italics, tables. It allows forms uh, with uh, input features, which you're all familiar with. Now, here is a small piece of HTML source code. Uh, again, I'm going to skip it um, because we don't have too much time. If you are not familiar with it, go read it because it shows you how to format a table using raw HTML. So, uh, there are uh, table with a table row, some of which are headers. This ID, name, and department here form the header. And then there is data for that table. We have not shown all the data. Um, but each row would be over here. And then there is a form in here. And the form has some text. It also has a select button, which uh, we are going to see in the next page. I'll come back to it. So here is the table with the header, ID, name, and department, three records. Then a form, which lets you select, search for student or instructor. Then you can enter a name and then click submit. If you come back here, the select is uh, uh, student or instructor is here. There's a select box. Name is an input box of uh, type text and 20 characters. And then the submit button is just a button, okay, which submits the form. And where does the form go? The form goes to the web server from which this form was downloaded in the first place. But with this uh, thing called person query, add it to the URL. The method is said to get, which means that the values for these inputs are actually going to go as part of the URL. Uh, they, if you have seen URLs with uh, some prefix, and then it says question mark, uh, then attribute name, value, then there are some separators, then question mark, another attribute name, value. That is the get method. There is also a post method, which uh, uses HTTP to transfer the values which the user has input, it does not become part of the URL itself. Post method is probably what you should use most of the time. Get method is used purely for read-only stuff, where you are not doing any update. Uh, so you should avoid the get method, except to get the form initially. When you submit the form, it should go by the post method. So the example we gave here is not really recommended, except for forms which are read-only. In this case, it is a read-only form which is going to display the uh, students with the given name or instructors with the given name. For this, get is okay. If you are doing any updates, you should never use the get method. Okay. So, a web server uh, acts as a front end. It receives the request. Then the request has to be processed. So, how is it processed? The web server itself may have a code for executing uh, Java, Java bytecode. Okay. So, that is one option where the 
web server is also going to run the application program, which was written in Java. Another option is for the web server to invoke another program and that program would be an interpreter. The interpreter would be for let us say Perl or uh, Python or one of the other scripting languages or it could invoke a complete executable program which uh, then runs and uh, there is a little bit more because the program needs to interact with the uh, web server to uh, take care of the HTTP protocol. It may need to tell the uh, server get this cookie from the browser. So, there is an API which lets the um, browser uh, sorry the application program and the web server talk to each other and that interface is called the common gateway interface CGI. Um, that was the initial the first one, but we are not going to use it. We are going to use a situation where there is a application server which can directly receive web requests and that application server in your labs um, tomorrow will be Tomcat and the Tomcat server can receive uh, directly web requests and process them by executing Java code and then send the result back. So, our web server is an is Tomcat tomorrow. So, now here is a typical three layer web architecture. You have the web server, you have an application server, a database server and then data. As I said, um, the web server could talk to the application server Tomcat and pass data on, but uh, these days typically this overhead of having two separate processes uh, is often avoided by having a single process which acts as the web and application server. So, Tomcat can do both these tasks. It can run the application program and it can take care of web requests and responses. So, that is what we will be using and Tomcat can connect to a database server. Now, a lot of web applications have millions of users. So, if you have a single machine down here, there is no way it can keep up with that kind of load. So, what they do is uh, instead of having a single web server here, they will have thousands of web and application servers. So, once they have thousands of web and application servers, um, what about the database server? So, in certain cases, uh, they manage by having a central database and then local copies of the data which are read only. So, there is still a single central database server. So, many applications run like that, but if you take a really large scale application like uh, Gmail or Yahoo mail, uh, there is no way that a single database machine can handle the kind of load that uh, these guys put on the database. As a result for really large scale services or for that matter Facebook, many of you would have used Facebook. There is a lot of stuff in Facebook which is actually stored in a database. So, how do they handle it? So, what they do is actually have thousands of database servers also or at least hundreds. So, they have potentially thousands of application servers and hundreds to thousands of database servers. Each application server will talk to whichever database server it needs to talk to and there are a variety of tricks here. Certain systems will provide a single interface, you just run SQL and the database server will figure out how to partition it. Certain others partition the users. So, the application server has to figure out which of these hundreds of database servers has the records for this user and it will go talk to that database server and get the required data. So, there the data is partitioned in a way that the application knows and it has to deal with the partition. That is a lot cheaper because then you can buy off the shelf databases and use them uh, with in fact, you do not even buy it. Facebook for example, uh, uses uh, MySQL the free database server. So, it is one of the largest users of databases on the fly in the world probably because it has such a huge number of hits and it has thousands of machines running MySQL. But all of this is transparent to you as the user. You have no idea whether it is one machine or 10,000 machines. You have no clue. It does not matter to you. When your request goes, it will actually go to one machine and all your interaction is with that one machine. When I go, I will also be talking to one machine, but it may be a completely different machine. Now, the HTTP protocol, which I told you, 
which lets the browser and the server talk to each other. It is what is called a connectionless protocol. What does this mean? Well, actually there is a connection established, a socket is opened, data is transferred. But the key point is this connection can be closed immediately after a response is sent back. That is the socket if you, in the network level is closed. This is actually fairly important for web servers. If a web server gets thousands of requests per second, which a single machine can handle, and each of these opens a connection and then leaves the connection open for a long time, for hours, there is a problem. The uh, connections are a finite resource on any operating system. Uh, why is that? Well, it is a part of the design of the TCP protocol, but there is a limit on how many connections a machine can have open at a time. And as a result, um, the uh, HTTP protocol is designed to let the connection be closed immediately after a response is sent. Now, if the user asks a follow up query, that is a brand new connection. The problem is, given that each connection is new, how does the uh, application server or the web server know who it is talking to it? So, one moment I send a query, the next moment you send a query pretending to be me, how does it know whether I am still talking to it or now somebody else has jumped in and is talking to it? That is the question. And the solution is to use what is called a cookie. What is a cookie? It is just a small piece of text containing identifying information. Now, what is this identifying information? Um, it is some usually randomly generated uh, set of characters, which the application or the web server will send to your browser after authenticating you. So, typically it can be used for many reasons. So, cookies are used for uh, tracking individual users, uh, for dealing with ads and so forth. But the use we are going to have for cookies is so that once you log in, the uh, server knows who you are. You have given a login name password. The server knows who you are. Now, when you make subsequent requests, it is a brand new connection. At this point, how on earth does the web server know it is still you and not somebody else who is connecting to it? And that is one of the uses for cookies. That is the use we are going to talk about just now. So, the trick is that the moment the server gets your login and password, it knows who you are. It authenticates you after checking the password. And it is going to send back some piece of text to the browser and say, this is a cookie, save this value with this name. And later on, it will ask for the cookie of that name. Now, your browser will not give away this cookie to somebody else. Now, you know, I was talking to one web server and another web and at the same time in another tab, I talked to another web browser. If that web browser can ask for the cookie which this one set, there is a problem. It is going to reveal information to that fellow who had no business knowing what I am talking to this fellow. So, this cookie which is set by this guy will only be given back on request to this guy. So, why will the server ever ask for the cookie back? Well, the next time you go and open a connection with the server, the server will say, ah, here is a new connection. Do you have a cookie which of this name which I sent you earlier? If this is the first time you go to that browser, uh, to that server, the browser will not have that cookie and it will say, sorry, I do not have a cookie. If it does have the cookie though, so if this is a second interaction, it will send the cookie back. Now, this is a randomly generated value. The web server can check, had I, did I send this random value to somebody a short while back? Who did I send it to? And say, okay, I sent it to Sudarshan who I authenticated 10 minutes ago. And so, I know that the person who is talking to me now is still Sudarshan. If somebody else wants to jump in and pretend to be me, they can't because they don't have that cookie value. Now, this is why if another web server that I am talking to in another window, if it asks for the cookie and the web browser gave that cookie back, well, then that guy can pretend to be me and cause damage. That is why the cookie will never be revealed to anybody except the server which set the cookie in the first place. So, that is how cookies are used to establish a connection. Now, eventually, if you are inactive for a while, your session times out. What is happening? Nothing happens in the browser usually. The server which is keeping track of, I send this randomly generated large string to the browser and it was associated with Sudarshan. 
if I have been inactive for say 20 minutes or 2 hours or whatever the uh, server decided, it will say, okay, from now on, I am discarding information about this cookie spring which I had sent earlier. So, now if I, if the server comes and if I make a new connection to the server, the server says give me the cookie value, I will send whatever I meaning my browser will send over a cookie value. The web server gets the cookie value and looks up in its table, uh, who is the user associated with this cookie. And guess what, a few minutes ago it just threw it out because my session timed out, it threw away that information. Now it will no longer find it and it will say, sorry, I do not find that string in my table, uh, so I do not know who you are, so log in afresh. So, that is exactly what happens when you go back to a site after a break and the site says, uh, sorry, you have to authenticate yourself again. Moodle does this, uh, mail systems do this, everybody does this. So, cookies are the core infrastructure. Now, a program which runs on the server needs to be able to uh, deal with the uh, HTTP protocol, including dealing with cookies and so on and uh, thereby talk to the user, deal with authentication, receive a request, decide how to process it, talk to a database and then send the result back. So, all of this is the job of the uh, application. Now, a lot of this is common to all applications and so, what has happened today is there is an API called the servlet API, which lets the application server talk to the application code which a programmer has written. So, there is a bunch of code on the application server which is common to all applications. This includes code to which implements a HTTP protocol and so forth. The rest of the code is application specific. So, what the programmer does is he writes this code in Java and that is loaded on to the application server. So, when a request comes, uh, the uh, server should also be told that when a particular request, uh, in our earlier form, we had a form called person query. So, the server has to be told that whenever a request for the form person query comes, you should invoke this particular servlet. So, um, that is told to the server and when a request comes, the code for that particular servlet class, that class code is executed, which has already been loaded and it is executed when a request comes. So, to build different features to applications, you build different classes, which are all part of the servlet class, it, they inherit from the servlet class and you sub load all of these onto the database server and depending on the request which comes, the appropriate class is executed, the code for that class is executed to deal with that particular request. So, the request for person query which we saw will be one piece of code, but there will be hundreds of such uh, forms each of which may go to a different servlet potentially. So, the way a servlet is done is it is loaded onto the server. Whenever a request comes, if the server now in this, if the server has a single process, a single thread, it invokes this, uh, the methods of this class. Actually, what happens is a new object is created and the code is invoked on that object each time a request comes. If this code will prevent the web server from processing any other requests in parallel, there is a problem. This code was written by application programmers. They may do something which takes a long time, it may take 10 minutes and in that 10 minutes, the web server will hang, no other requests will get processed. That would be a very bad idea. So, the servlets do not work that way. Instead, each time a request comes, the server spawns a new thread on the server. What is the thread? It is a separate uh, you can think of it almost like a separate process, it is not, but many threads can run concurrently within the same server, a huge number of threads can run. So, the fact that this particular thread which was serving this particular request is taking a long time does not affect the web server directly. Meanwhile, it can receive and process other requests. So, all web servers uh, are basically threaded and the servlet API is a Java API. Now, there are uh, similar APIs in other languages which do similar things. Uh, we do not have time to discuss all of them, so we are only going to look at the servlet API. 
Okay, so let's look at a small piece of uh, servlet code, uh, which does the following. Uh, let's start from the beginning. There are three imports. What are the imports doing? They, the Java I/O library. There's a Java servlet library, and then there's a Java servlet HTTP library, which the servlet interface was designed to work with other protocols also, but the HTTP uh, protocol is really the one which is most widely used. So that's only one we are going to look at. So now uh, the person query, we have created a, a class called public class person query servlet. We could have called it anything we want, but the key thing is it extends HTTP servlet. So what does it mean to extend HTTP servlet? It means that all the functions which are uh, there in HTTP servlet are inherited by it. Moreover, it has to override certain functions and the primary functions which it has to override are three. There is a do get and correspondingly a do post or uh, there is a, there are a few more uh, which it can use. Um, so let us focus right now on the do get. Why do get? If you remember the HTTP code we saw earlier said that here is a form whose method is the get method. So there are three methods, get, uh, post and uh, what is the third one? Uh, I forget the name. So uh, it, the method has to be specified as one of these. And if the form specified do get, uh, the get method, then the server will invoke this particular method, do get on the uh, object which it creates. And it passes in two parameters. One is a request whose type is HTTP servlet request. The other is a response whose type is HTTP servlet response. And there are some exceptions. We will deal with those later. So what does the servlet have to do? It has to take input from the request and uh, it has to push, put output onto the response. So here is uh, what it does. Uh, in this case, the response is a HTML page. Therefore, it says response dot set content type text slash HTML. So that is HTML content. It could also be sending a binary image for a photo or various other things and correspondingly the content type will have to be set. Now since it is a text response, it does a print writer out equal to response dot get writer. So this is an interface to write text to the response. And then on this object out, it says out dot print line and this is HTML text which we saw earlier uh, similar to that. So it says head title query result slash head, then body and then the actual content what it wants to display will go in here which will all be printed out to this out object. This out object is linked to the response. So whatever it is printing here will eventually be sent back to the browser. When is it sent back? It will be sent back when this do get finishes. When it exits, all of this is sent back to the browser. Uh, so when it is finished writing whatever it wants to write, it says slash body to indicate the body ends and then out dot close and return. So that is basically what a servlet does to process a particular query. Now the body here depends on what it needs to do. So in our case, if you remember that form took a name and it took a parameter which is either student or instructor. And depending on whether it was student or instructor, it looked up the name in the student relation or the instructor relation and it returns uh, information about people with that specified name. So how does it, in, how is this implemented? This is what we want to implement. How is it implemented? So there are several steps here. The first step is to do request dot get parameter person type. This person type is a parameter that name person type is there in the form. It is an input person type. So the person type will have a value which is either the form is going to set it to student or instructor. So what this does is if person type equals student then do something else if it is for instructor do something else. Uh, there is also a name. How does it get access to the name? Similarly, request dot get parameter name will return the value of that name. So now it has these two variables which have the type and the, uh, this should have been name not number, I am sorry. So um, it then goes in and 
does something. What does it do? Um, it has to talk to the database to find out people with that name, students with that name. Uh, how does it talk to the database? Well, JDBC. Now, we already discussed JDBC and some of you have already done the JDBC assignment. Okay. So, use JDBC, get the information and then that information has to be output to the browser. How do you do that? Well, we have created a table, out dot print line table uh, with three columns and then there is a header which says ID name department uh, and then for each result we loop. That loop would typically be on the result set. We have got a result set back after running a query. We loop on the result set and for each row of the result set we output this thing. What is the out output? Well, first get ID name and department name from the result set into local variables and then print the value of these local variables onto out. So, this again is formatted in HTML. TR is table row slash TR ends the row. TD is data for a single cell of that table. So, TD then the text and then slash TD ends that table uh, cell and then another cell and so on. So, all of this is low level uh, HTML coding. Um, as I said, if you code using uh, these things, it takes a little bit more time to build a web application. Uh, that is one of the reasons that, uh, uh, you know, it is a little more time consuming than building a client server application for which there are some very uh, nice tools. Long, they have been around for a long time. Such tools are being introduced now for uh, web applications too, um, but they are not yet as standardized or as widely used. Okay. So, you can get away from the details of all this. There are libraries and tools today which you can use. I am not going to cover them because there are many such tools. There is no standard. If I tell you use this and tomorrow, you know, it is no longer uh, widely used, it is not supported, you are locked into that tool. Uh, so, I am not telling you which one to use, but there are many on the available. There is one which I can uh, recommend to a large extent called uh, YUI, Yahoo User Interface, which uh, lets you do a lot of other cool stuff with JavaScript also to build a rich interface. So, that I can recommend. Okay. So, coming back, all of this is output and the result is sent back to the user and displayed. So, that is the basic way in which a request is handled. That was for a get. There is also a do post if you use a post method and the body of it is identical. There is no difference. It's just that the method is called get or do get or do post. Otherwise, there is no difference at all. Okay. So, far so good. The next feature which servlets provide is the session feature. I told you that you can set a cookie and create a random value, send it to the browser and so on. That is a lot of work to be coded each time. So, the servlet API wraps all of this and gives you a much more easy to use interface called a HTTP session. So, internally it sets a cookie. In fact, there are other ways to implement it without cookies also. So, it can actually use one of those ways. Uh, how it implements it does not really matter at a high level, uh, but what it gives you is an abstraction of a session. So, what you do is when you get a request, the servlet code can check if a session is active already. So, if a session is not active, that means this is the first time a request has come and then what does it do? Uh, so, how does it check if a session is active? It says, if request dot get session false is true, that means there is an existing session. If, um, uh, if it is true, then we can directly process the request. If not, there is no existing session and we have to redirect to an authentication page. Now, what is this parameter false here? The idea here is if you set this value to true, then it will create a new session if there was not one in the first place. That is useful for certain situations, but typically we would not do that. Uh, what we will do is uh, when, the, when we check here, we will set the parameter to false. When we want to create a session, we will set it to true after authentication. Okay, so, how does the authentication page work? It will ask you to enter a login password and when that is submitted, a servlet for authentication will check the login and password with the 
uh, database uh, relation which stores user names and passwords. Uh, again, all of this code has to be written carefully without ever concatenating user input. Remember the SQL injection problem. You should be careful to use prepared statements in the correct way to prevent SQL injection. And as long as you are careful, you can go fetch the data from the database to validate the user. And then if the login password match, you create a new session using request.get session true. That returns a session object. Now the session object can actually be used to do various things. So the first time you authenticated the user, next time the user comes in, the session is active, but how do you know who is the user? Okay, a one way which a few students have used, which is wrong, is to use the cookie mechanism to directly set the username as a cookie which is stored on the browser. That is very wrong because people can hack the browser code and set whatever cookie. So user XYZ can set a cookie which says user ID is Sudarshan. And then when that request goes, that badly designed application will think that XYZ is actually Sudarshan because the cookie value says Sudarshan. That is a very bad idea. What you should instead do is say session dot set attribute and the attribute name is user ID and the value is the user ID of whoever was just authenticated. So if it has just authenticated me, it will do session dot set attribute user ID Sudarshan. This information is not sent to the browser. It is stored in the web server. So when a new request comes from me, it will not contain the user ID. The web server will go uh, ask me for the cookie, which is a randomly generated string which it created. So if I had already talked to the browser, that cookie random string, the session protocol does not know all of this. We do not have to worry about it. But internally what happens is this string is sent back. It will check that string and say, ah, this string corresponds to a particular session which was created earlier. And so the uh, next uh, request, if the session is active, I can say session dot get attribute user ID and the saved user ID which is completely in the, uh, in the web server. The user ID never went to the browser, so it is safe. And so session dot get attribute user ID will give the user ID which we know was set earlier after authentication, so we can directly use it. We do not again have to ask the user what is your login password on each request. That obviously would be very painful. Each request asking for login, password, and so on. So that is how the sessions work. Now in your uh, lab exercises tomorrow, you will be creating uh, servlet sessions and authenticating users and do all the basic things using servlets. Um, some of you may already know all of this, uh, but I suspect uh, quite a few uh, may not have done a lot of programming. Um, so here is a very quick uh, quiz question which is not really a quiz, it is a survey question. I over here means you, not me. So option one is used servlets already. Option two is used equivalent features in another language. example dot net uh, PHP etc three uh, never built a web application but know the concepts and option four all of this is new to me Okay, so here is a quick survey. Uh, all center coordinators, please make sure things have been activated. Um, participants, please press ST and get your remotes ready. Okay, uh, time is up on that question. Obviously, there is no one correct answer. I uh, will continue while uh, the results are uh, brought up and then we will discuss the results. So um, I mentioned this briefly that uh, servlet code actually runs inside of uh, 
uh, some application server and the most commonly used one is Apache Tomcat although there is another called Glassfish which is widely used and another called JBoss which is even uh, more widely used because it supports a whole bunch of other features uh, which are part of the J2EE including the beans and containers and whatnot, which I am not covering here. Uh, they are quite useful, but they are not essential to what we are doing. So, uh, those are the free ones and they are very good actually. Tomcat in particular is very, very widely used. But there are also a whole bunch of commercial ones which offer certain other features very useful for uh, certain applications. So, that those include web logic, uh, web sphere, uh, oracle application server, uh, I forgot to mention Microsoft's uh, IIS and a whole bunch of other servers. And these servers uh, support deployment and monitoring of servlets what is going on. So, in Tomcat there is actually an administrator console which lets you see what are all the uh, servlets uh, which are active on this system. And each servlet is actually part of a you know you can create multiple servlets, package it in a single thing called a web archive or war and upload that war as one application to the uh, Tomcat server. Now, there are actually a number of steps here for deploying this thing onto the server. Uh, luckily, when you use an environment such as Eclipse or NetBeans, all of these are done uh, transparently for you. You do not have to deal with this nitty gritty details. Um, but if you are going to use this in a real uh, application, you will have to figure out how to copy these uh, upload these war files which are created onto uh, Tomcat which is running not on your desktop, but rather on the web server. That is the one extra step, it is actually very straightforward. But you will mostly be able to do all of this without ever seeing that step. Okay. So, let us see. Uh, this time most of the centers have responded. We have 190 responses. So, we have improved and I do not know if you can see the responses. Uh, they are interesting. So, about less than half the people have actually built an application using uh, either servlets or anything equivalent. Servlets is actually less than a quarter and others are slightly less than servlets. So, for those who have actually built any web application, servlets has a slight lead. Uh, there are many other things. People use PHP very widely. There is something called Ruby on Rails which is used widely. Anything which Microsoft builds of course, is used very widely. So, there are many alternatives. Uh, we stick to servlets because we cannot cover 20 alternatives in a book and servlets uh, support is free unlike the Microsoft stuff. Uh, although, in terms of technical quality, uh, many of these are just as good or uh, as servlets. There is nothing wrong with them. Okay, then, the third option never built an app, but know the concepts again there are about one fourth and slightly more than one fourth say that all of this is new to me. So, for those in this last little more than one fourth, uh, we are probably going very fast on this um, and uh, you will probably need to take a little extra help in the labs tomorrow from your center coordinators and from one of the other half who already know some of this stuff. So, do take help, but make sure you write these programs so that you understand how to build these. Uh, a feedback which I had uh, got from uh, certain people is that a lot of uh, places around India, you know, they, they all are doing fine on the theory part because textbooks are available, slides are available, but the lab component is something which they do not know uh, how what to cover. I hope that this course, uh, you know, half of it being lab based will help all of you in especially those in this last quarter, uh, actually last half who have not actually built anything to get your hands dirty with building stuff. Because only when you do it can you uh, tell your students yes you can do it and you should do it in this lab. And only when our students start building this as part of their courses. Now, I know that most students do end up building some of this as part of projects, but I also know that Unfortunately, the way projects run, I have seen this myself, is that they are groups, they cannot be individual because there are too many students. And in any group with three or four people, uh, it often is the case that one or two do the work and the other uh, two or three take a free ride and end up doing nothing. 
that is very bad. We are allowing people to graduate uh, who have never even built any simple thing. Uh, so, that is very wrong and so, do make sure that in your courses a lab is enforced. I think pretty much all universities now have internal assessment and the lab should be a major component of internal assessment. Again, the goal is to make sure people have done stuff and understood it. They can take help to understand, but at the end of the lab, they should have understood what all needs to be done clearly and built something on their own. That should be our goal. And part of it is to be able to ask them uh, questions at the end to see if they understood what they did. Okay. So, I think that is it for servlets and so that covers all the basics which you need for tomorrow's lab. The other half of this chapter I am going to cover fairly fast because we have, uh, they are not critical for the lab. Uh, they are stuff which you should know, but you can read it offline. So, one of the components is actually quite useful still which is server side scripting. Now, I showed you how to build a servlet. It turns out writing a servlet is a lot of work because you have to take all the HTML text which you want and stick it inside print statements in uh, Java code. It gets very messy and very, it is quite hard to understand what is going on. So, very soon after servlets came out, people realized there were drawbacks and there is a server side scripting language called uh, JSP, which actually combines plain HTML with Java in a very uh, clever way. We are going to uh, see an example of that and that can be used. You can certainly use JSP even in your assignments uh, tomorrow, probably it is not required, but if you do anything more on this, JSP is actually something very, very useful to reduce your programming effort and what is it we will see. Uh, the basic idea of all these scripting languages is you write HTML code directly and how do you write the HTML code? If you know HTML, you can write raw code. If you are not very familiar with HTML, there are editors which let you do HTML uh, editing directly. In fact, what is nice is you can create really nice looking pages with these HTML editors, even though you do not really know much about HTML. So, you can create uh, nicer looking websites. So, now you have created the HTML, the content has to be in there. This is the HTML which will be sent back to the user on in response to a query. But the content is not just static HTML, it is stuff which you have got from the database. So, now what you do is you edit this text and stick in there small pieces of Java code which do the actual work of talking to the database, getting the response and then printing that. So, what you need to print from which you get from the database is the only thing which is inside of Java code. The rest of the static content of the page uh, is all directly in HTML and can be generated with any HTML tool, that is the idea. So, now what you have is HTML code with pieces of Java code or PHP or any other language code embedded inside of it. So, it is kind of flipped. Earlier what we had was Java code with HTML in strings. Here it is flipped. You have HTML code with Java code inside special delimiters. And here is an example. So, here is the static content of the page. HTML, head, body, slash body, slash HTML, all this is static. So, this is created directly in HTML. Now, the dynamic part here, uh, this is actually a toy example. What it does is it uh, checks if uh, the parameter name has been set uh, in the request. If so, it says hello and prints the name. If the name is not set, it just says hello world. It is a toy, but obviously you can do more interesting things here. For example, our person query servlet could be done here by taking the input from the request and processing it and printing the output. So, inside here the Java code looks identical to what we saw before. The request and response are standard words predefined. So, you can just say request dot get parameter, um, out is also predefined. Uh, so, all that has been taken care of without your seeing it. So, you can directly say out dot print line hello world and so forth. Now, what actually happens is this JSP code is compiled on the fly by the 
uh, application server into Java, it is actually rewritten into Java servlet code, compiled and loaded on the fly. JSP has a number of other features including new tags and so on, which can be useful, but are not essential. So, all of this was Java based. Now, Java is a strongly typed language and it takes a lot of lines of code to do simple tasks. Now, this notion of strong typing is very useful for building complex bodies of code because it prevents you from making silly errors, which can be very, very difficult to detect in large bodies of code. But when you are writing small pieces of an application, uh, this, uh, all this extra ma typing machinery, which helps to protect you from yourself, may actually result in you doing a lot more work, but the benefit of it is limited. So, there is a whole class of scripting languages, of which PHP is a very widely used example, which are very loosely typed, which let you do a lot of stuff by writing a little bit of code. Um, of course, at the risk of uh, programming error uh, being hard to detect, but if your whole program is just one page, it is not spanning uh, thousands of uh, lines of code, this may be acceptable. In fact, PHP can, is actually very widely used. Uh, it's, it's a very nice language actually. And uh, all of you have used Moodle. Now, you know that Moodle is a very, very rich application. You have seen only a few parts of it, but it has a huge amount of functionality. It is one of the biggest uh, applications which are available in public, where you can actually download and see the contents. And it is very well written actually. Uh, it, I would recommend, uh, you know, as a project for uh, students, uh, when they, as a course project, it is a bit ambitious, although some students here have modified Moodle as a course project. But as a BE project, uh, taking Moodle and then modifying it to add new functionality would be a very nice BE project. They would learn a lot by reading existing Moodle code and then modifying it. And Moodle is written entirely in PHP. So, it, PHP is a very powerful language. Can, uh, and Moodle, one of the nice things is it has a number of coding standards which are followed very strictly. And you can see real uh, life code which follows standards and which has been designed very nicely to achieve, you can do a lot with just a few lines of code because libraries have been built appropriately. So, I urge all of you to get students to explore the Moodle code and play around with it. So, coming back, uh, what is PHP? I am not going to explain what is PHP in detail, but I will just give a small snippet of PHP code. Again, PHP is typically embedded in HTML, that is its goal typically. It does not have to be. PHP programs can exist outside of HTML also, but here is an example of embedded PHP. This first part is the same. Then you say less than question mark PHP to indicate it is a PHP script. And then it says if not is set dollar underscore request name echo hello world, else echo hello dollar request name. So, it looks syntactically a little different, but it is basically doing the same thing as the uh, JSP code we saw before. Okay, so, that was for JSP. Now, your Eclipse uh, and Tomcat both support JSP. So, you are welcome to play around with JSP in addition to Java servlets. They also support PHP for that matter, but that is a new language which you have to take some effort learning. Okay, now, moving on to uh, client side scripting. What we saw was server side scripting, which is scripts which reside on the server are executed on the server and return HTML to the user. Now, in addition to HTML, you may return JavaScript, which is the most widely used client side scripting language. S uh, Flash is also widely used as we discussed. There are a few others. Uh, applets, which is a Java code, which is run on the uh, browser, were popular at one time, but they have fallen by the wayside. They are no longer used much. Uh, VRML is another one, which is used occasionally. Uh, you know what JavaScript does. I am not going to uh, go into too much detail, except to say the following. It is very widely used, as you know. One of the key things which JavaScript does is it can modify the contents of the page. So, what you get is when you send a response to the browser, you are sending HTML code along with embedded JavaScript code. That JavaScript code can actually 
modify the HTML which is residing on the browser. How does it modify it? Well, the HTML code is actually passed and created, uh, turned into a tree structure. And that tree has a representation called the document object model or DOM. The JavaScript code can directly access that tree and modify the tree. It can, uh, if you want to add a row to a table, for example, it can go down to the node of that tree, which represents a table. That has several children corresponding to each row. It can add a new child corresponding to a new row. So that is how you have certain applications where if you click on a button which says add row, a new row pops up and then you can fill in the row. Uh, it can do validation. So if something should be a number, when you click submit, it checks that it is a number and says sorry, it is not a number and prevents you from even going back to the uh, back end. So it can do certain uh, validation at the front end. Uh, it can uh, in fact do something more. Uh, most of the current generation of web applications are based on what is called web 2.0. What is web 2.0? It is not a brand new technology, but it is HTML plus JavaScript used in ways which it was not done earlier. And one of the key ways that web 2.0 differs from the earlier web applications is that uh, in the earlier applications, only when you click on a submit button would interaction normally happen with the backend. There were a few exceptions. In the new generation of applications, which appeared in the last five, six years, the applications have JavaScript code which talk with the backend. And what they can do is they can do this in the background. So your JavaScript code is running. You type in something. You don't see anything happening. In the background, that code is started off. It talks to the uh, application uh, server, gets some information, and then displays it in the page. You didn't see the page refreshing. Nothing happened. Everything was quiet. And something just appeared magically in the page. Or you started typing in a query to Google. And Google magically completes the query for you. So what is happening is each time you type a letter, once it gets three or four letters, it sends something to Google in the background without interrupting your typing. It gets back some responses saying that these are the things you can fill in uh, as completions for this query, and it displays those. So all that is happening in the background without your noticing it. And it's so fast that between two uh, key clicks, it has already uh, done, gone back, got something and display it to you. So that's really nice. Uh, so all of that is done by what is called asynchronous uh, execution in the background. And there's something called Ajax, which um, basically it's a collection of tools which lets you do this asynchronous communication. It's, it's not one language or one tool, but it's an approach to building applications which do all this stuff asynchronously behind the scene. And these have enabled this new generation of web interfaces, which are much nicer for users than the previous generation. So we have some more examples of JavaScript. This one uh, does validation of form input. It checks if um, something is, uh, if you entered the credits, it checks that credits is a number which is between 0 and uh, 16, or in this case, greater than 0 and less than 16. Uh, and this piece of code tells you how to invoke the JavaScript validation function as uh, part of the uh, over here form on submit return validate. So I will skip the details, but you can get JavaScript code executed when submit is clicked. <laughs>